Um, it's my pleasure to, um, to welcome D David Shea from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in, um, in Atlanta, um, specifically the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Disease. Is that uh, the correct center? Uh, um, and and um, David is a medical doctor and an epidemiologist who um, works at CDC on um, on influenza and uh, other respiratory diseases, and he's going to talk about um, how should we assess the annual health burden associated with flu. I am not a mathematician, um, nor uh, am I like Justin, someone who uh, uses math in, in his day-to-day -day work. Um, I do think that, however, um, I uh, try to incorporate sort of the, the most recent um, uh, advancements in, in, in disease burden estimation into my daily work. Um, and what, what, what I'm going to try to start out with is um, sort of in this idea of bridging data and models is to sort of think about how to make better use of the data that we have about influenza. I'm going to make it really sort of um, the most relevant that we can. Here's a, here's a, um, a paper that was published a day or so ago. Um, in, in, uh, in Lancet Infectious Diseases. Um, and to, uh, here's a commentary by Heath Kelly uh, uh, that's going to um, make a, an assessment here. In the Lancet Infectious Diseases, Mike Ostrom and colleagues report a meta-analysis on the effect the efficacy and effectiveness of influenza vaccines licensed in the USA. Although not confined to, the, to a country of licensure, similar analyses have been published by the Cochrane Collaboration. However, this study is new in a few ways. And so, um, give me a, a little bit of um, leeway in uh, sort of going through all of this material here. But the, the important point really is that influenza vaccine, about halfway down here, it's a specific intervention and assessment against a specific outcome. Evaluation of influenza vaccines against non-specific outcomes, such as influenza-like illness, hospital admissions due to influenza or all-cause mortality potentially confuses the understanding of the true burden of influenza and the effect of influenza vaccines. Now, it might also be an appropriate time to use revised estimates of the most appropriate effectiveness of influenza vaccines to examine the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of some of the uh, policy options. This examination would need to be done in conjunction with studies that, similar to the new meta-analysis of the effectiveness of influenza vaccines, use highly specific laboratory converted outcomes to assess the influenza burden. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. My background is I'm uh, I, I'm a medical doctor with um, a few um, <clears throat> way in the past, a few sort of courses in math. So I had, um, you know, the first two courses uh, in, um, in calculus, I had uh, differential equations, and then I had... Um, it was lost to me at the time, but highly recommended by my um, my mentor that I look at linear algebra. And of course, linear algebra has been the most useful thing 
in, in, in my background. But if we look about and we think about how to, um, from a big point of view, think about how influenza and its effect on the population um, should be assessed. We come to a few outcomes and a few perhaps um, ways that we might think about how to um, count that outcome. So infection, <clears throat> we can make distinct counts of how many people are infected with influenza in any particular year if we do serologic studies <clears throat> with a prospective cohort. So by that I mean that we have a, a group of people who at the beginning of a particular influenza season we have a baseline um, serology on them and we have a follow-up uh, blood count. Um, at the end of a particular season to see if they have um, converted for a particular flu outcome. But that's not really what we care about. Do we care about illness? Well, maybe, yes. And we can sort of see about illness with um, the best way to do that would be with um, reverse transcriptase um, polymerase chain reaction results, the most accurate way to, to see if we have um, evidence of a influenza infection in a person. And we can do that for illness through many designs. For medical visits, yes, we can do that as well. And by that I mean, do we have evidence that a particular person who was sick with a particular illness um, actually sought care for that illness um, and cost something. Can we do that for hospitalizations? Um, yes, we can. And this is where, from a policy point of view, we start to get into something that makes um, a big impact in that hospitalizations for respiratory illnesses, including flu, cost about um, Ten thousand dollars per outcome per hospitalization. Um, that's something that varies dramatically by the age group of the particular person who's hospitalized, but it's a big deal. Um, it's about ten thousand um, dollars. So we can look at that through RT-PCR outcomes, but one of the challenges right there is that. Um, some of these outcomes that result in hospitalization are going to occur after um, viral shedding um, for influenza is done. Um, typically, it's most easy to um, assess or to find flu in the first two to five days after a person becomes ill. Um, and when fever decreases, so does the opportunity to find flu. Um, so then we get to deaths, which is something that um, Andrew and others have been quite interested in. Um, and now I think it becomes very difficult to say um, what a, a particular outcome uh, in, in flu might mean. So here's a graph. Uh, it looks at the rate of underlying pneumonia influenza deaths and the percentage of um, respiratory specimens that are positive for flu as reported to a particular reporting system, and that's the World Health Organization reporting system um, for um, influenza viruses that are it's a relatively stable um, uh, system uh, that, that comes to us at CDC. So here we're looking at the specimens testing positive for H3N2 viruses, uh, 
which by and large, um, I think most would agree, um, have the most impact upon particularly older people um, by week from um, 1990 through 1998. And if you look at this kind of graph, I mean, this is where I start out with what I do on the sort of a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, we have certain seasons. If I can get this, maybe I can't, but um, we have certain seasons like Here, or here, with a percentage of things. Um, which are really quite remarkable for those of you who, are, who do not think about flu every day. Um, we have um, sort of certain seasons where we have highly aberrant, if you will, um, influenza circulation. And what happens sort of in those seasons is we have some increase in um, all-cause mortality, or here, um, a relatively non-specific outcome, um, influenza and respiratory, uh, influenza and pneumonia um, deaths. Um, so for many years, influenza-associated deaths have been used as one indicator of the severity of um, influenza seasons. And modeling techniques have been used for decades um, to estimate the flu-associated deaths um, using the sort of the final um, data that are reported to our National Center for Health Statistics. However, influenza deaths directly are difficult to enumerate because of influenza symptoms are nonspecific. They vary with with age and typically with older people we don't um, see that um, flu deaths are correctly categorized. Um, it's also important to realize that testing of patients for influenza is uncommon, particularly among elderly individuals. And what we're really looking at here in terms of flu deaths are late sequela of infection and the specific ICD-9 codes for influenza, which is the ICD-9 um, code uh, 487 is rarely used even d uh, during pandemics. Um, and it may be used actually in, in unexpected ways. So here's a, here's a sort of a, I think a really interesting set of data here. There are underlying influenza deaths for this time series from 67 to 76. This code in the um, um, national mortality data. And here's <coughs> pneumonia deaths. And so we had one pandemic in this time period here in 68, and we had one sort of concern about a pandemic, and that was when the um, 1976, 77 sort of um, swine flu happening happened, but it wasn't a pandemic that people were concerned about that we might have a pandemic. So here we find that while we did not have a pandemic, the use of, of the specific code for influenza went way up, even above what happened during the real pandemic in 1968. But when we look at the 
sort of a broader category of deaths, which is pneumonia and, and influenza deaths, mm -hmm. we don't really see much of an increase over the baseline. Um, however, during the time period that we actually had a pandemic, it's something that Andrew has thought about um, in 68 and 69, we had an increase in um, both the specific use of this code and um, the uh, PNI code um, But we also saw, um, which is quite interesting, I think, um, an increase that's really quite unexpected in the use of the influenza code in periods of time when flu was not expected to be, to be in circulation. So, and we saw a decrease in um, the use of that broader code in terms of influenza. In, in terms of pneumonia uh, in a similar time period. Um, to me, this suggests that we have to be pretty careful about how we think about these, um, these uh, influence and sort of the broader codes that are used to um, think about the assessment of uh, categories of disease that might be associated with um, a particular um, pandemic. Here's a series of graphs from, um, from Andrew's work that shows that even during the 1968 pandemic, if you look at these, and these are on a log scale, <coughs> we find that um, it's clear that um, the use of the influenza death codes here is really, um, I guess, um, incredibly invariant in, in, in the use of how these codes are used for a broader category of disease, and that's pneumonia. I mean, I think here we have something happened here that wasn't really picked up by the influenza specific codes. Um, but that's about it, right? I mean, fairly amazing. So to think about, um, to get to my point of view, what I particularly think about or am asked uh, to provide data on um, is how influenza contributes to um, sort of annual deaths in the United States. So we could look at um, pneumonia and influenza deaths, these PNI category. It's about 9% of all U.S. deaths. And through a variety of models that we'll talk about in a little bit, I mean, we would say that only about 3% of these deaths seem to be um, uh, those that are categorized as being the underlying cause of death. Uh, about 10% of those underlying cause of death estimates appear to be associated with influenza. Um, and some would say that of that category, we underestimate those that might be associated with influenza. And, for example, we would use the 57 and 58 pandemic, um, which was particularly um, important in older people. And um, that pandemic caused a significant amount of um, mortality. Um, in older people due to causes that were not um, coded as PNI, typically sort of cardiovascular disease. So if we think about respiratory and circulatory deaths, that's most of the deaths in the U.S., so 
53% uh, of those underlying. When we use um, sort of cause of death estimates to tie things back to flu, we would say that about 3% of these underlying deaths are associated with influenza. And this is, from my perspective, a sort of a likely reasonable category um, to use in modeling influenza deaths. There's also, a, a, however, a great literature that looks at all-cause deaths and, and sort of tries to um, associate those deaths with influenza circulation. And it's, that's likely, uh, from my perspective, an overestimate. I mean, there are a lot of um, sort of um, wintertime increases in deaths, even sort of on a fairly um, mild basis, like um, fire-related deaths that are unlikely to be associated with influenza. But if we do sort of trust the models, about 2% of all-cause deaths um, in winter seasons are associated with influenza. So traditionally, and this goes back to actually 1963 by um, a gentleman uh, named Robert Surfling. Influenza deaths have been modeled in temperate countries that do show a distinct pattern in seasonality with a time series of mortality data using a periodic <coughs> excuse me, regression of the form. Really quite simple, as you can see there. And this has been referred to as a surfling model, um, acknowledging Robert Surfling. Um, and this linear regression model has been fit to pneumonia and influenza mortality data and some subsequently other death categories in a variety of countries. And here's a way to, that we've used this data more recently. Um, with some more um, secular trend data. Um, and here's what we've done. I mean, it's well known that for the U.S. at least, um, we not only use these models in the U.S., but for the U.S., that um, We've seen a decrease in um, respiratory and cardiac mortality here over time, but yet we see um, distinct patterns of um, excess in some seasons um, that don't fit within that overall time series. And if we use a surfling model to sort of which is just a, a simple model that takes into account um, the, the trend over time and the baseline. We can come into um, make assessments that these deaths or these deaths or these deaths seem to be um, way in excess of what the um, trend over time would indicate. Um, so, so I may be confused by that. Sure. If the data are above the model, why does that mean the data are in some situation? I'm sorry? <coughs> well, if the data are above the model, why does that mean it's only from influenza? It means the model is no good. Right. Right, right. Hang with me for a second. And, um, I mean, here's data from um, the most recent years. <clears throat> and um, of course, one of the questions was what happened during the 2009 pandemic. Um, and we did not have um, final data from the US um, as opposed to other countries um, because um, large 
states like California actually have a two to three year time lag in the provision of data to the, um, to the national health systems. Um, so the, the question is, how do we know that um, deaths associated with this particular time series are flu associated? It's, it's a good one. Um, I don't think that all deaths that are um, temporally associated with um, flu or necessarily flu associated, but we're going to, um, if you can hang with me for a few minutes, I'm going to ask that we, we look at um, a few ways to look at this question. Um, in 1957, after the 57-58 pandemic, um, the U.S. started um, with an acknowledgement, really, that we had no way to um, collect um, the final data from our national mortality reporting system, which stands true today. Um, tried to collect data from uh, 122 cities about that um, large cities that could uh, provide data. And these data come from um, pre-sort of um, final data. And they um, come to us at CDC here. And what we get is actually the proportion of deaths that have um, pneumonia or influenza indicated as a cause of death um, by week um, with the denominator of um, sort of all cause deaths. And what's been done for many years is sort of a, um, a very um, crude um, assessment of what's going on by the proportion of um, deaths that list any kind of pneumonia and influenza cause over um, the time period uh, of interest. And so, for example, in a bad, if you will, HBN2 unit, we see a, sort of a significant increase in PNI mortality, this ratio. We also see in, um, in this pandemic sort of a, um, an increase that doesn't look like, um, well, it looks like it was different than the, than the, than the baseline. Here are the cities that contribute or the jurisdictions that contribute to this 122 cities system. So um, it's predominantly um, sort of, the, you know, the Northeast and Midwest. Um, I don't think we have Irvine. Um, but I think there are th some things that, to think about. Um, so the National um, Center for Health Statistics data, which is NCHS, so this is what gives us all data in the U.S. We have, for a country, a two to, th two to three year time lag in the provision of national data, which is underlying records. Um, California is actually uh, the reason we have a two to three year time lag. Um, it's a big deal, actually. Um, most other countries that we would like to compare ourselves to have a less than 12 month time lag. Um, 
and France, for example, that's about a week. So if you die in France, they know within a week that that's in their their assessment. Um, the cause-specific outcome, so whether it was due to um, influenza, code 487, pneumonia, I see the nine codes for 80 through 46, will take about another week to come into play. In the US, that's two to three years that we will have access to that data. Huh? No, it's access. Um, California has access to, California is 30 million people. California is 10% of the US population. California does not have access to this data in that time frame. If there's one thing I can do today, it's that would be useful from a public health perspective. It would be to get California, which I know has um, sort of um, challenges that we all have due to our sort of making best use of, uh, of dollars and, uh, and, and what can be done um, for public health. But um, really, if California could get their act together, we could speed up the uh, availability of um, cause-specific information from the United States by a year without any California is, Texas is a bit six months behind. California is two years behind. You can't. It's 10% of, it's 30 million people. No, it's not. Well, it's close. It's close. Um, anyway. You'd think, yeah. You'd think. Right. Well, so let's go to 122 cities. Okay. You brought up a really good point. So 122 cities, a mortality reporting system, um, actually records about 22% of the deaths, or 23, in, in the U.S. with about a week delay. And this system was started in 1957 after that pandemic. And so we thought a lot about ways to use these data to forecast, if you will, the lagging data that we have from the U.S. as a whole. And the reason why this is a particular, I mean, I've sort of, France has data lagged about two weeks. The UK has data uh, lagged about a month. Um, Romania has data lagged about four months. But we have data lagged for two to three years. I mean, uh, kind of embarrassing. So what we've tried to do is look at um, ways to use the 122 cities data um, to forecast. Um, uh, the, the final death certificate data in the U.S. So each weekly data point in the 122 cities data corresponds to a data point in what would be the final mortality data. And we only have data for 122 cities, but for example, we would have data for Los Angeles or Fort Worth or Chicago. And these data are available for an quite a huge number of weeks, back to the 80s. And so um, using these data, um, we've run some linear regressions 
to make predictions, um, basically using a stepwise procedure to select cities for the informative data. And even though we don't have, and you know that I'm incredibly upset that we don't, um, even though we don't have data for all of the US, um, using the, uh, the data from 120 cities is not that bad until we get out here. I mean, that R squared is good, but when we get out here, we, we actually have some problems. Um, but if we sort of plot the two time series together um, with um, these are data that um, we have in the red line is the um, 122 cities data and in blue um, is the uh, data we have, the final data we have from the, the National Health Certificate data. Is it more city data in the 2000 calculation than the 1980 calculation? No, we don't. So it's pretty low now. It does. It does. It's a good point. An excellent point. Something we thought about and looked at. Um, but you're right. Yeah, well, we haven't, this is a good point, we haven't like really tried to assess um, that, but that's something we could look at, I guess. And so here are estimates, um, this is skipping ahead, I guess, of influenza-associated deaths using a surfling model, which would as assume that um, deaths is, um, in periods of time that happened when flu was in circulation were associated with flu. And so here are sort of for any particular season in the green are the um, influenza um, specimens that tested positive that were, were reported to the um, U.S. flu um, surveillance system uh, sort of compared with what happens um, with the mortality data. And I mean, I think we see that um, what happened in 2009 was a little bit aberrant. Um, but in general, um, we see that when um, flu was detected, we saw, we saw deaths. Here are the um, sort of similar um, data for people less than 65 years of age. And the, uh, it's worth pointing out that the baseline here could be said to be 5% of deaths, 5% um, of specimens, excuse me, testing positive for influenza. And we have, um, here are for any particular season, um, the percent positive. Um, and in this age group, we see, if you will, sort of not necessarily um, sort of a concordant picture that we saw before. Here is um, an assessment made with a very simple model um, of influenza-associated deaths um, made during the um, H1N1 pandemic um, using the 122 cities data to forecast what we might have seen 
um, in terms of all-cause mortality um, for the U.S. as a whole. Um, we only have um, one really pandemic season, 68-69, to correspond to these data. Um, but we would see that, in general, we see um, our estimate with very broad confidence intervals. Um, was something that wasn't that dramatically different from what we would see from our annual assessment of what happened um, due to flu. What's different is that um, this age group was affected. Um, and typically, 90% of flu-associated deaths are, we think, happen in older people. Um, but that wasn't the case during the pandemic. Yes. I'm yep. Sure. Sorry, just to calibrate myself. Sure. The numbers on the previous table, those are what I can compare to the number of people saying 39,000, 40,000 deaths per year. So these overall seem quite low. Right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. These are low because this is low, right? So we have a folks saying the number 25 to 54. You say that's high. What is the average? 4,000. What happened? What happened is that, um, well, I don't know that we can say really. Um, Actually, I think it's down here, and um, this might be an overestimate, actually, because we're, um, we had some late-season influenza detections that were not H3N2, that um, were not um, necessarily closely aligned with um, mortality, but that um, had something to do with it. 4,000, that's for H1N1 or for flu? This is H1N1, yeah. The 4,000 average. What's the average for H1N1? Um, that's, that's, um, that's difficult to say, because what happens in a typical season is that H3N2 and H1N1 will overlap in this sort of their, um, but we would say that in a typical season that most of the deaths in older people are associated with H3N2. Um, where I was going with this, H1N1 affects younger people. Correct, correct. Correct. High. Still high. Still high. Right. This is based on respiratory infection. This is based on um, our efforts to um, sort of take the data that come into the 122 city system and extrapolate it to um, respiratory and cardiac deaths in the United States. So um, I know I've only got five minutes. So I, for you guys, there are, um, and this is not something I say to CDC all the time, but there are tremendous number of weaknesses here. Um, I think we do have some strengths, though, um, and our estimates are within an envelope of deaths that could be associated with influenza. In other words, we start out with respiratory and circulatory deaths as the envelope, and we try to figure out what might be due to flu within that envelope. There's a whole other series of um, mathematical modelers who have tried to build um, what might be due to flu during the pandemic or during any other season, sort of starting with um, 
case attack ratios, moving to fatality ratios, moving to um, uh, that are not bounded by um, an envelope. So if we assume that, for example, um, that a certain proportion of people who um, have uh, flu die, um, we can end up with a estimate of flu-associated deaths that are actually larger than the um, envelope of respiratory deaths. That's happened in some countries. So at, at least this, this method uh, avoids that possibility. It also is consistent with methods um, that have been used for 40 years to uh, estimate flu mortality. And, you know, we do provide uh, point estimates with confidence interval. Um, however, we do s suffer from this big problem that um, all death models rely on baseline estimates that assume basically that anything that happens in excess uh, of a baseline estimate in flu season is associated with flu. It's also worth pointing out that, that um, we don't know what happens, really, um, in aberrant flu seasons like um, those associated with a, a pandemic, and that um, we d it's difficult to come up with type or subtype specific estimates of death. Um, so, um, this really, I mean, really hasn't been a mathematical talk. Um, but from my perspective, um, it's useful to start with this kind of a, a thing in that um, this is the kind of data that gets used um, on a national and international level in the United States and other countries to sort of put flu into perspective in terms of um, uh, how big a deal it is um, in causing mortality. I mean, I think the two big points are, as Andrew has pointed out and others, that um, you can't just count flu-coded deaths and figure that you're getting at a good estimate of flu-associated mortality. Um, but the converse is that, um, particularly with data from the pandemic, you might not necessarily be able to use the sort of accepted uh, ways to um, make age-specific assessments of flu mortality during the pandemic situation um, and be in a good place to feel comfortable with what's happening. And then finally, in the U.S. is my big point. Um, we are years behind what's available in terms of data mortality from Argentina or Brazil or China or in, well, India is kind of constrained. But um, it's from my perspective, it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. We don't know what, and it's California, by the way. It is California. California holds up the whole U.S. mortality reporting system because there are, there's not, um, and it's 30 million people, right? It's 10% of the U.S. population. It's 30 million people. Um, so you guys, I'm saying this, Only on that note. you guys are holding us up. You guys are holding us up. Thank you, David. Let me, let me just ask you. Sure. So the first question, if I may ask the um, organizer. So what, um, by the way, just parenthetically, it's, it's worse than you. It's, it's even worse than that because uh, Cecile Zavud of NIH showed me a yes. data set where um, 
California, after finally getting the data into NCHS, um, a few oh, months, months later said, oh, by the way, um, uh, we found, you know, 10,000 more deaths that we forgot to give you or something. <laughs> and um, and the, uh, the NCHS just said, you know, forget it. No, like, you guys are always <laughs> late. And so, so the final mortality statistics for that year that, that everyone, used, including myself, used um, are missing 10,000 deaths all from California. Um, and, and, and this is known, but they just decided that they're not going to um, constantly revise what are called final mortality statistics. But my question is, um, so why do circulatory deaths peak in the winter? Um, well, that's a good question. Some proportion of those deaths um, are clearly associated with flu. I mean, it's just, it comes back to... Um, but why flu it comes not? back to William Farr you know, in, in 1839. Not, you know. I mean, if you looked at the data that came out of small cells in London in 1839, there was clearly the thing that they called grip at that time because obviously it wasn't flu. We didn't, we didn't have um, a, a specific virus that, that could be associated with, um, with mortality. Um, there's clearly in temperate countries, not necessarily other countries, um, a really close relationship between the isolation of influenza viruses and mortality in old people. Um, I don't think we have that totally worked out. Um, but why flu and not other wintertime viruses? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, why yeah. Flu? Well, I think we do have a few things that, that help us there. One, as you know, that in the past, that people assumed that other um, wintertime viruses were not associated. Um, and that's not true. We, we, we've seen. Um, data from the U.S., from the U.K., from Douglas Fleming and others, that it's clear that there are um, patterns of association um, with respiratory syncytial virus that are at least um, as consistent with those with flu, particularly in older people. We have known for many years that these viruses um, are associated with um, hospitalizations in younger people, particularly children aged less than one year of age, but they also seem to have a even controlling for um, for flu um, big impact in older people. Um, some other viruses like metanumavirus that do create um, well, that are associated with um, higher uh, hospitalization and medical care utilization rates in younger people are not associated with mortality in older people. Um, I think one of the, one of the, if I will, um, one of the interesting things to think about going forward, one of the challenges that we might think about as a group um, is it's clear that there are patterns um, based on just time series data um, of by age group um, of medical care utilization data and death data that are associated with different viruses that are difficult to tease out and make sense of um, on a medical basis, um, coming from the point of view of someone who's a pediatrician and who had a few semesters of calculus, um, they don't necessarily make sense the way that we can describe the, the, the easy data. Um, but they um, are consistent over time. 
So how do we, how do we as a group, sort of um, going forward in countries like India or China, um, how should we help them think about um, the patterns of flu and other respiratory virus circulation? How should we help them think about those patterns and mortality in those countries that are going to have um, obviously much greater impact um, on the sort of global perspective of what these um, viruses might do when we have um, challenges to in data that we can get in the U.S. and um, unknown patterns, if you will, of particular um, seasons like um, pandemic versus a typical question in the best. Sure. The, 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 uh, the sinusoidal curve that was used, was that a, uh, a, a best fit approach or was there some underlying well, that's a great question. That's a great question. It's a best fit approach, but um, but that's not to say that um, really it's the best fit, right? I mean, there's a lot in the baseline that we don't understand, and the, the disadvantage of any of these methods, even the methods that make, um, which I haven't talked too much about, even the methods that make direct use of the viral surveillance data in the model to, 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 to come up with access to our best ones. We don't know, we don't know what proportion of that sort of sinusoidal curve um, it might be due to the viruses that we're trying to make. Right, so yeah, I, I agree that uh, you know, the root, it's almost a different root sometimes every year. Absolutely. Different viruses, and so having one best fit to, to try and capture all the different uh, HX and uh, K uh, things, uh, four things. What um, you gave a list of weaknesses, and just following up on Carl's comment, you gave a list of weaknesses in terms of the methodology and techniques which you're using. What is the CDC doing to? Uh, Try to address those. I mean, what kind of research directions? What kind of ideas? Yeah, are you thank you, <laughs> thank you. That's a great question. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do, and I didn't have a time. I'm, <clears throat> I'm kind of. I've got a respiratory virus myself. I don't know if you can tell. <clears throat> so I'm kind of out of it. Um, but one of the things that we've really tried to do um, is that in age groups, in during time series where we have. Um, the opportunity. We've tried to um, use viral surveillance data obtained from prospective cohort studies. So you have a number of people who come into a hospital situation, for example, and are tested for flu and other respiratory viruses by what we think is a really good um, test, which is predominantly um, for these um, RNA viruses, um, reverse transcriptase um, polymerase chain reaction results, which are much more sensitive compared to um, either the traditional ways to figure out whether someone has a, a flu infection or another. We've, we've tried that. And people have done this in other countries as well, including Hong Kong. Great series of data have come out from there. So we have tried to um, sort of validate our results from these mathematical models with data from time series um, that have made use of um, sort of specific diagnostic um, patterns. And in general, they look pretty good. Um, the thing we can't do, really, and I think the challenge going forward is 90% um, of what we think 
are flu-associated deaths occurring people 65 years of age and older. So um, we're never going to be able to, I don't think, um, sort of line up diagnostic patterns based on specific test results in people of that age group and look at mortality because many of these infections or many of these outcomes are going to be late sequela of um, uh, 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 flu infections. However, when we look at kids, for example, hospitalizations due to kids um, based on these methods, we've got a paper in press now at JID, for example, um, are very consistent with what we see um, from a approach, very expensive approach, that depends on um, specific diagnosis of, uh, of infections uh, with uh, RT-PCR. We should uh, take a break for the next speaker. There's uh, coffee and refreshments uh, over there. Sorry. Thank you, David. Thank you.